Rhythm Alive by Pierce Nace Read by Al Richardson Chapter 5 For a brief breath, the mantis didn't move. Dyke sat motionless in the tree, feeling his heart thudding so loudly that he could hear it, and wondered whether Slayer could hear it too. He was terribly aware that the great green mantis could fly up and tear him to bits, as he had every other living thing that Dyke had seen him look upon. And he wanted to be no mantis's meal. He went tighter with every breath, growing so taut, at last, that he seemed more stone than man. He could sense, almost feel, what death by Slayer would be like. In his mind, he could sense an arm being pulled off by the giant insect, feel the blood running from his body where the arm had been attached. Then, view the red tide helplessly as it streamed from him, reddening the earth about him in crimson pools of life's fluid. He seemed to feel the other arm torn from him, both legs ripped off, while the river of blood grew greater with every new stab that the beast's claws made into him. He seemed to feel his life rushing from him, as it almost had that night in Texas. And he knew that if Slayer ever decided to eat him, no vaquero or anybody else could save him. He wondered what the men who had been the mantis's victims had felt when the beast's claws had ripped open their stomachs and chests. And he seemed to feel the claws tearing him open, like enormous knives, exposing his internal organs and slicking them to shreds or pulling them from their hold inside him and chewing them in his frightful mouth, slopping intestines into his maw in great handfuls. It remembered what other men's intestines had looked like as Slayer ripped them out, and he knew that he would look the same. Would he already be dead by the time the beast cracked open his head? The monkeys had not been dead. He'd halved their heads while they still lived, so they'd felt the crash that killed them. Dyke shivered, recalling the scene. God, you'd be terrified one second, cracked into pain too great to be envisioned the next second, and then, mercifully, dead the third second. And his own death would not exhilarate him. He closed his eyes, clinging with all his strength to the trunk of the tree in which he was hiding, hoping the branches did not give way. Could the beast smell? Many animals tracked human beings by their scent. Suppose Slayer had memorised Dyke's smell and would trace him to the treetop. If that happened, he would have no chance against the mammoth insect. The imagined sight of the pool of his own blood was increasing with every breath he drew, until he was gasping soundlessly, hearing his heart pound harder, hoping against terror that Slayer would not capture him and tear out his thudding heart, strewing blood all over this clearing. Then, to his utter amazement, the hideous beast turned and faced the open cage, his eyes popping once more, his outside belly shaking as he made a run for the animal meat that was still left in there. Dyke caught his breath, gasping his heart-stopping relief. Slayer had remembered the meat in the cage. God, he'd remembered. Dyke was down the tree within seconds, leaping the few yards of space to the cage, slamming the door and snapping the padlock. 
At last he turned and fell back against a growth of bushes, choking for breath as relief washed through him, the wildest relief he'd ever known. Only once before in his life he'd been in such danger, and he'd scarcely been conscious then. This time he had been totally conscious, totally terrified. It was only now that he sensed the pounding ache of his head. Probably it hadn't left him during Slayer's escape and recapture, but he'd not felt it in those fear-filled moments. Knowing now that the beast would be unable to escape his cage, Dyke unlocked the door to his cabin and went inside. The thief had thrown everything, helter-skelter, smashed dishes, banged Dyke's homemade furniture against the walls to rip it apart, cast books and papers and magazines into the fireplace and set them aflame. But Dyke could repair as much as he needed, he was certain. Decor was no worry to him, especially in the dense jungle. He need only necessities to live in this shack. His real homes were his houseboat and the place he'd thrown together with oddments of boards and tin on Malpello. The island house was gone now. Crushed either by the quake or by the beasts that had occupied the small peaks that jutted from the ocean. But some day Dyke would return to Malpello, and some later day, when he'd disposed of his four enemies with Slayer's assistance, and perhaps the help of other mantises that he would coax onto the mainland as he'd coax Slayer, Dyke would be in possession of all the money and property that his erstwhile pals owned. With them, and their families dead, there would be no one to claim their holdings, except Dyke. He was no longer the money grabber he'd been as a boy, but he wanted what the four men had as part of his revenge. He would use whatever he got, after their blood and bones lay about his feet, to build himself a home on Mampello. If there was wealth, the house would be a mansion, the kind that the wealthy cattlemen of Argentina lived in, the elegant rooms in which they entertained so lavishly while they enjoyed their lives of ease and comfort and satisfaction. Then he might have chairs that matched, he might have a rug on his floor and even a piano, though he did not know one note from another. He would be in command of thousands of mantises and they would fend off any attacking humans who chanced his way. How would he feel when he turned Slayer loose on Pete Stewart, when he saw Pete's body being torn limb from limb by the unbelievable giant? What thoughts would be his when he watched Pete's flesh disappear down Slayer's throat, as Pete's blood stained the ground or the floor or wh wherever it would be that the mantis tore him to bits? God, the death of Pete and the others, Zeb and Cain and Ryan. They'd be joys to Dyke. Such pleasure as he'd never felt before. He would laugh and shout and sing as Slayer ripped open their hated bodies, as he clawed out their insides and chewed them to nothing as he broke their bones and sucked the marrow out as he swallowed the blood that ran from their dismembered bodies, eating on and on, until all that was left of them was a pile of bones that had been shredded dry. The first step in that direction, he reasoned, would be his concoction of whatever liquid or paste he could use to cover himself, and thus render him inedible to the beasts on the island. He would test potions on Slayer until he discovered the one that would repel the great insect and make Dyke safe. Most of his chemicals, medicines and other possible materials for this purpose were on the houseboat down at the pier. If the tidal wave had spared any of them, they would be useful. If they were ruined, he'd have to replace them. He said aloud as he made plans. I'll have to make a trip to the boat to see what I've got. 
but I can't let Slayer die of thirst or starvation while I'm gone. Ordinarily I can get back here in oh, four or five hours, but if a jungle storm comes up the way it does whenever you don't expect it to in this rainy area, I could be delayed overnight. He recalled his effortless trapping of small forest rodents, and he set about trying to repeat it. He emptied a sack of sugar into a wash basin and sprinkled it with his own mixture of musk odour and the scent of jungle flowers mashed in the wild smell of animal flesh and blood. The concoction had coaxed animals from far and near every time he'd sprinkled it about his shack. Usually the animals were small, but sometimes they were fair-sized. And if they reacted today as they always had they would be to path into Slayer's Maw. He could visualise the creatures, some small like rats, others as large as deer, as they would follow the sugared trail, as they dared to venture close to the cage for the sake of licking up the sweetness that had brought them there. He could sense the swiftness with which Slayer's claws would shoot out. The rapidity of the beasts clamping onto the bodies through the bars of the cage. The way the blood would gush from them as the creature's claws slashed them to bits and pulled the little pieces into his prison to devour them, smacking his great jaws, making his delighted hissing noise as he ate out their hearts and livers and intestines, as he cracked their heads open, and clawed out their brains for the dessert of his meal. He felt certain that animals would come to Slayer and satisfy his appetite while Dyke was gone. Even if the jungle animals licked up the sugar along the way, the scent of the mixture would linger for at least two days, which would give Dyke plenty of time to get back. He took the basin outside and walked into the woods with it. A quarter mile from the cabin, he began to sprinkle his lure. Letting go only a slight stream of droplets at first, saving plenty to last the trip to the cage. When he came in sight of his shack, he made the sugar trail heavier, carrying it straight to Slayer's prison, and on inside, tossing all he had left through the bars. As he had known would happen, Slayer lowered his head and absorbed the sugar, every last grain of it. But that didn't disturb Dyke. The intoxicating smell would be there, and would bring animals to him. They would be his food, and their blood would be his drink while he was alone. He hurried down the path toward the ocean, wanting to lose as little time as possible. He was conscious of the beauty of the jungle forest as he walked, and he realised that he loved this land almost as much as the natives did. The lush growth of trees and grass and flowers, the chirping of small insects, the singing of birds that usually could not be seen, everything combined to make it a good place to have a home. When he reached the coastal settlement near his pier, he saw the people of the village gathered about their meal, which consisted of raw meat, a packer, an agouti, and a raccoon that some of the men must have brought from their hunting trips. Dyke noticed that such a feast was unusual. These people being mostly lean and hungry and obliged to sustain themselves on nuts and berries that grew close by. Now, however, they were dining sumptuously, on the raw meat that they'd sliced off the animals. The creature's throats had been cut, but not a drop of blood tinged the ground. Dyke remembered that these particular Indians loved the taste of blood and sucked it from the animals they slew, as fast as it flowed from the stabs they made into their prey. The men, women and children were swinging their machetes and cutting slabs from the animals gobbling the flesh without cooking or even seasoning, filling their half-starved stomachs to fulfilment as fast as their hands could rush food from the slaughtered animals to their mouths. 
Then one man stepped forward and slit the raccoon's underside open from end to end, thus opening the belly to reveal the delicious bites inside. Dyke knew that among these people, the man who had brought in the kill always had first chance at the heart, and usually presented it to his wife or sweetheart, or to a man who he owed a favour. This time the Indian pulled out the heart, licking up the blood that ran down his arms, sucking up even the drops that fell on his bare knees and ankles and feet. He carried the bleeding heart to a beautiful young woman who was a little withdrawn from the group, apparently knowing that he would present the delicacy to her and waiting for him to do so. She was smiling, holding out her slender brown hands to receive the heart. She took it and held it in awe for a moment, then offered the man the first bite. He accepted it, smacking his lips over the taste that he evidently loved. Then the girl ate too, sharing the heart with a man. Dyke remembered that the man was Miley, and that the girl was called Tanza. They were a handsome couple. But Dyke thought, God, there is much animals as slayer. Downing raw meat like that. I've never known them to be cannibals, but I'll wager their ancestors were. They looked as if they'd as soon slash up a man with those wicked machetes as they would those animals. He tried to hurry past the crowd, not wanting to become entangled in any of the long conversations they so often invited him to share. But as he slipped past the feasters, he ran smack into a second cluster of Indians. All men, and seemingly sated with raw meat for the time being, they were talking excitedly, pointing north in frenzy, in fear, in awe. One of them broke loose from the others and blocked Dyke's way. He knew he would have to exchange a few comments before he could move on. He asked good-naturedly, What's going on with you fellows? The man was one of the few who spoke a little English. He told Dyke, Quake come in the ocean. I know, I saw it. I watched the whole storm. In boat? Yeah, I don't know why I wasn't killed in the storm. Storm kill Malpello. No, Keiko, the island's still there, but it's got danger there. Anyway, un until it settles down. You go, Malpello? No, not yet, but I'll go back some day. Take Keiko? Maybe, but, but, but don't try to go yourselves. In his mind, he added, I may take you out there for the mantises to eat some day. But he didn't say it. Keiko said, Maybe go to other island too. What? What other island? New island come up from sea, bringing dirt and rocks, make new island. The tidal wave did it? Much big island, Sanso say. He visited us yesterday. Say he see new island. Come here to tell. Dyke patted the Indian's shoulder. We'll go see it for ourselves some day, Keiko. Maybe not go. Scared to go. It'll be okay. New islands don't mean evil spirits. The man beamed upon him, then chanted. Sounds so wrong. White man say New Island okay. And then he burrowed into the knot of natives to reassure the others that the upheaval of the land didn't signify evil about to befall them. But as Dyke made his way to the boat, he asked himself, What is the other island like? Does it abound with giant mantises too? And where is it? How close to Malpello is it located? And God, if there are giant insects on it, can they fly or swim to my isle? Will they be even larger than the Malpello maltises? 
big enough to fight my beasts, to rip them open and eat them alive. If they ever do that, where will my army of vengeance be? But he put the thought from him at last and went on to the boat. The storm damage was extensive. To a fussy fisherman the boat would likely be in a state beyond repair. But Dyke was not fastidious. He told himself that a man with his scarred face should not mind if some of his possessions matched it. He could repair the boat enough for his use, and that was all he required. He might even patch up the sail and enjoy the tranquillity of drifting over the calm water again. One day, in the meantime he'd use his motor, since it still worked. He was lucky, damned lucky, that the storm had not swept the whole boat away, and him with it. He went below and filled two gunny sacks with all the chemicals and liquids that were stored there. He added all his edibles and inedibles. He was especially careful to include the few poisons he'd acquired in his stay in South America. In his years in this unpretentious land, he'd learned that almost anything could be found in the jungle when a man had the necessity to discover it. If his manufactured materials were inadequate for his purpose, he would dig up other ingredients, from the trees, from the ground, from the living things that dwelt about his cabin. He could snare snakes and rob them of their venom before he killed them, diluting the poison until it would not kill, but only repel. He could find plants that were harmless but carried a stench that no living thing wanted to stay near for long. But Dyke would not be repulsed by the evil odour. In fact, he would love it if it let him live safely with Slayer and the other new inhabitants of Malpello. The foul-smelling plants were few in the jungle, but he could mix a small amount of their scent with a mixture from the sack of supplies from the boat and come up with what he wanted. He said aloud, At least... I need to believe it. I've got to believe it. That's the only thing I've got to live for. Because it'll further my plan for revenge on those four guys making me what I am. An impotent no man. Before I die, I want to see the end of every part of my old buddies, every slice of flesh and drop of blood, every bone and hair, I want to watch them wiggle like fish on hooks and scream like banshees as the giant mantises eat them alive. He made his way through the jungle, hurrying as fast as he could with his load. All the way, his aching head forced his mind to go over and over the possible upsets that his immediate plans might have taken while he was gone from his island cabin. Slayer might have managed to break the bars of his cage. Dyke was sure he'd never witnessed the beast's top strength, and he'd hoped that he never would until it was time for the supreme test, the vengeance times. But if the beast had exercised his full capacity, he might be free. Or he might have reached through the bars and broken the padlock and escaped that way. If he was loose, the forest could already be running red with the blood of animals and natives that Slayer had clawed to pieces and dined upon. Bones might be strewn for miles, floating in streams of blood that ran in every direction under the dense growth of the trees. On the other hand, Slayer might be dead. It could be that no animals had followed the sugar trail to the cage to furnish the grey insect a meal. If they'd not, the mantis might not have survived. He seemed to want to do nothing beyond eating and sleeping, with much more devouring than napping. But when Dyke got to his cabin in the woods, he spotted Slayer at once. The mantis was asleep in his cage. He was hunched down, his head dropped on his distended belly. Surely he'd not hungered during the master's absence. 
The next moment, Dyke saw bits of rodents and other small things, plus the bones of larger animals, scattered about the cage and inside it as well. By the size of the pile, he knew that the giant insect had had many fine meals. He paused in his tracks as he heard a squishing through the grass, the kind of scuffling sound that young pumas and deer and opossums made when on the scent of something they hoped to eat. If Dyke stayed very still, he might get to watch Slayer capture whatever was making the noise. He stepped quickly behind a tree, making no sound as he moved. It would be interesting to see whether Slayer woke up when the animal neared him. And it should be highly entertaining to see the beast catch and kill the visitor, to spy upon the death that came with a ripped body, a torn-out heart, a flow of red blood that drained into the beast's throat until there was no drop left in the victim. The swishing of grass went on, and almost at once a puma pup came into sight. Always curious, the young forest creatures often proved to be prey for larger animals. If half a litter of any kind of pups lived to maturity in the jungle, it was surprising. The pup was now sniffing at the now empty trail where the sugar had been. The sweet taste was gone, but the pup looked as if he expected to catch up with it any minute. He kept running, pausing to sniff, sometimes running backward to re-sniff his tracks, then padding on toward the great cage in front of the cabin. When the sugar trail ended at the bars of the cage, the pup reached a paw through the bars and began to dig at the floor of the cement where the scent still was. He did not appear to see the great green thing asleep there, or, if he did, he gave it small heed. Food was his need, food that should have turned up as he ran along the path where this enticing smell led him. Suddenly there was a thunderous hissing sound, a roar of wings beating the top sides of the cage. A thud as Slayer leapt to the front bars and caught the puma pup with one clawed hand, clamping down so hard into the flesh of the young animal that it had no possible escape. As the beast held the pup captive in one claw, his other claw reached through the bars and ripped open the puma's body, spilling the blood that Slayer could not reach to suck. Yet the conquest furnished him with a body he could dismember and pull into the cage to devour. He jerked off the legs and tossed them into a corner of his prison. Amid the tortured screams of the pup, the sound so nearly human that Dyke had confused it more times than he could remember. Then Slayer literally pulled the young body to bits that was small enough to be slipped between the bars of the cage. He scraped the organs from the inside of the animal, pulling each bite-sized piece into his domain. He clawed the flesh from the outer part, tearing it from the fur, grabbing it through the bars. Last of all, he reached with both hands to grab the head, broke it off at the neck and pounded it onto the bars with all his strength, popping it apart. He scooped out the brains and added them to the store of food that now awaited him. Blood splashed on the trees and bushes, smeared the cage, stained the ground in front of it. The hot smell of the fresh blood and the sickening stench of it as it dried into red splotches on the jungle terrain awoke interest, even pleasure in Dyke. Though animal deaths did not give him the thrill that human killings did, yet every death, animal or man, he told himself was working as practice for Slayer and for Dyke too. They were preludes to the big murders. He muttered aloud, God, that mantis really goes after it when he gets a live meal. Chew him up, Slayer. Eat him like you'll eat Pete Stewart before long. Learn to love flesh and blood more every time you kill. 
He raised his voice and shouted, Eat, Slayer, eat your fill, get all the blood you can out of that pup. I like to watch you chew, you marvellous killer. The beast settled down to enjoy his latest meal that had come his way, hissing between bites, often raising his giant wings as far as the cage would allow, as if to assert, to assert himself and all others who wished to know that he had power over the air, as well as power over the earth and its beings. Dyke thought, God, he's a blessing to me, the kind I've never known since that night in Texas. But I have to be careful when I'm with him, because he could grab me the way he grabbed that young puma. He could eat me in under, oh, ten minutes, leave my bones scattered in front of the cage with the bones of the things he's eaten since I brought him here. He could leave my blood dyeing the ground the way the pups is doing now. I can't fool around with this thing I've captured, not even for the uplift he gives me when he eats and kills. I've got to start training him for the four-man job I've planned for him. And I can't let myself be killed by the killer.'